Welcome everyone and uh, welcome our two presenters, uh, Paul Richardson from Vita North America and Greg Everett from Sierra Dental Tool. Good morning, guys. Morning. Morning. Thanks for having us. Excellent. So I'm really excited to have you guys here. We've been talking about doing a talk uh, about this topic for some time and uh, we've had some discussions that led us to this presentation this morning. Uh, both of you guys have been doing some really cool things around uh, PMMA milling. Uh, Greg and I have worked closely for the last year, more than a year, about uh, bringing uh, efficiencies into uh, PMMA milling. I guess I won't take all the credit, but there have been other professionals out there that have been doing things with Greg as well. Uh, and then Paul uh, shared with us some really cool stuff uh, related to denture milling. And we felt that those two uh, those two topics uh, dovetailed really nicely together where we could talk about some of the advancements in denture, uh, digital denture manufacturing, um, which uh, Paul will share with us today. And then Greg will tell us how to get that stuff realized and manufactured. So with that said, that's the topic of the day. I will um, allow these gentlemen to introduce themselves uh, first. So go ahead, uh, Paul, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself for those that don't know you? Yeah, so my name is Paul. For those of you guys uh, who don't know me or haven't met yet, uh, you know, I am a CDT. Um, you know, my background is actually in dentures. Uh, I've done a little bit of everything. Um, and uh, But my specialty really is CAD CAM and digital. And so that's what I've been doing for the last, uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 years. And, you know, kind of as digital has become, you know, more and more uh, integrated, you know, coming up with a lot of new uh, of these processes and protocols and, and stuff is very important. So, um, you know, digital ventures was really the next thing in line uh, after a lot of this crown and bridge stuff. And so we've been trying to, you know, figure out a lot of these questions that we had and manufacturing was a big one. And, uh, you know, Greg actually ha has been, uh, uh, you know, helping me and we've been working together almost since I started in CAD camp. And so, you know, when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, milling and that kind of stuff, he was the first guy I thought of, you know, to, to, uh, you know, work with and try out some stuff. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm now at Vita, uh, and I'm a product specialist and technical trainer and, uh, you know, doing a lot of R and D stuff and some training on some of our new products. Um, uh, one of them is our new digital denture tooth line, which is our Vigo tooth line, which I'll tell you about in a second. But I will let Greg go ahead and introduce himself, and then we'll talk a little bit more about dentures. Thanks, Paul. And, and you know, uh, again, Paul, Paul's really the go-to guy when it comes to digi digital dentures. Uh, you know, when I have a question, I always, always hit him up. So um, my background, uh, dental technician, uh, trained in... All the different processes in the dental lab uh, ran a milling center for about 10 years um, i know how to i know how to work with di with digital and different milling machines scanners uh all the fun stuff so uh um here at sierra we're always looking at uh trying to innovate and cr create different uh workflows for dental labs make things more efficient and uh happy to have the opportunity to to show you guys what we've got uh what we've got going here so Pass that on to you, Fernando. Excellent, guys. Well, for those who don't know me, my name is Fernando Catania. I work for DG Shape, division of Roland that uh, makes CAD CAM solutions for the clinical and laboratory space. And uh, I work with these two gentlemen and other professionals in the industry to bring solutions to you guys, uh, as well as through our, our dealer network, uh, which many of our innovators and solutions creators themselves. Uh, so they integrate um, CAD and CAM and imaging solutions with our mills. So I work on both ends, the uh, the commercial side, as well as uh, with our partners to bring you guys solutions. So with that quick introduction, let's dive into the topic of the day. So uh, Paul first is going to show us some of the cool things that Vita has been doing uh, to, to make um, the CAD CAM or the digital denture more efficient and in line with with uh, the digital workflows that you guys are doing, so providing you guys tools that are easy to implement with your with your know-how. So go ahead, Paul, take it away with that. Awesome. Uh, let me uh, let me throw my screen up here. 
Awesome. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the, the Vita Vionic Vigo, which is our den de digital denture tooth line. Uh, this is just going to be a really super quick, brief overview. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. Uh, you guys, please, you know, call me, email me later on, and we can, we can discuss it more in depth. Uh, this is just a brief overview. I'm going to talk a little bit about the process and the teeth, and then we'll get into all the fun uh, fun milling and manufacturing stuff. Okay. So, um, real quick, the digital denture workflow, there's a lot of people that are kind of nervous to get into this, that, you know, Crown and Bridge really jumped on the digital thing first and digital dentures have kind of been lagging behind. And, um, so, uh, you know, there's, cause there's a lot of manufacturing processes that we still tried to work out. Um, the, the, the great thing about it, though, is that the workflow really hasn't changed a whole lot. Uh, just the tools that we're using, um, you know, are changing a little bit. That we're still making an impression, we're still doing a, a tooth setup, and then we're still processing a denture. Okay, so it's not quite as scary as it looks. Um, the other part of this that is really, really cool is it's very versatile, which means that you can use any piece or part of this that benefits you or your laboratory or practice or, or whatever. Um, so real quick, this is what the workflow looks like um, that, you know, impression scanning, uh, you know, we can debate, you know, traditional impressions versus digital impressions. Um, you know, we can debate that at a separate time. So we'll just call it uh, uh, acquisition, impression acquisition and digitization, you know. Uh, once it's in the computer, then we're going to do our digital design. And I'm going to go to kind of a, a you know, real quick live uh, a setup and play with it and show you the software, what it looks like. And then we get into the manufacturing. You can do a try-in, do a reset up, um, and then do the final manufacturing finishing, which we'll go into, and then I'll hand it over to Greg. Uh, so this is what the software looks like. Uh, you're going to uh, mark certain uh, locations on the on the, um, the denture you're going to outline the base and then we're going to get into the actual teeth itself um, which really makes the biggest difference um, and uh, that the tradition that the in the tr transition into digital what a lot of companies have tried to do is use existing denture teeth in the digital process. And the problem with the existing denture teeth is they have those very long necks, which are meant to be trim or cut down, and they've got undercuts because they're meant to be processed in that acrylic base through the lost wax technique. Um, so they don't just passively insert into a printed or milled base. And so we really needed a redesign of that denture tooth for that with digital manufacturing in mind. So that's what we did, and we kind of got rid of all the stuff you didn't need. So you can kind of see what, you know, we don't need and we did, you know, got rid of on that too. Um, oh, man. There we go. Um, uh, the other thing that's really cool, if you guys have ever made any of these, is that, you know, you probably have seen the the, the incisive papillas or the, 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 the gingival, uh, down there, you know, very razor sharp uh, papillas. And, um, uh, you know, so we redesigned the two so that, that when you're manufacturing, you know, they don't break off. Uh, you, you know, when they're gluing them in, they don't have to recontour them and stuff. They're much more natural looking. Also, if you guys have ever used the, uh, the gingiva in the Crown and Bridge module, uh, it was really a, a pain. Um, and uh but they completely changed it for the um uh, for the denture module and it works so much better and you get these really nice looking uh adaptation to the soft tissue and 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 that kind of stuff uh also the teeth are uh tapered so they you know drop right in uh but they're also made so they don't rotate uh there's really no ambiguity about the how they go in there they can't get mismatched you can't put them in the wrong way they just go in and they fit really well um, they're based on our uh, Excel and our Lingoform teeth, so these are premium digital denture teeth. And what's cool is they are a true denture tooth. Um, 
you know, because as nice as those multi-layered uh, PMMA discs get, you're never going to have that translucency or that look of a, a true layered denture tooth, and that's what these are. Um, and then you can go through how hard they are and all that other kind of cool stuff. Um, the other big important thing here is that we have provided more than 600 different setup combinations with perfect occlusion and function, all right? Now, this is really important that when you bring these teeth in, they come in pre-set up, which is going to save you a ton of time uh, when you guys are doing your denture setups. And I'll kind of show you what that looks like in a minute. Uh, the other really big important concept here is that um, we need to be able to translate the precision uh, of, of our design from the design to the prosthesis or else we're completely defeating the purpose of doing all this digitally, okay? Um, that, you know, if we've got these, these uh, teeth setups that have perfect function and occlusion and we can't translate that to our final prosthesis, then what's the point? And up to this point, um, you know, some of the other companies and, and some of the other techniques have been using uh, uncured resin, uh, milled teeth, and carded teeth in this kind of process. The problem that creates is that that uncured resin is very, very viscous, very thick, and because of those teeth have undercuts and whatnot, uh, they're working with a 150 to 170 micron gap, okay? So there's a huge amount of room there for movement of those teeth. Um, so when we've gone from our really precise design and then we lose it, well, when we're getting to our manufacturing, then we've defeated the purpose of this, this uh, uh, digital process. So to be able to do these at a 20 micron gap, okay, that is, that's smaller than most of you guys are using for crown and bridge, all right? Uh, then we are able to translate that precision very, very well. So uh, once we've produced these, the chair time for adjustment and function is, is very, very low. So let me actually jump over here to um, uh, the software, and I'll show you what it looks like real quick, and then uh, we'll get into some of the uh, manufacturing pieces of it. I think one Questions of the so things far. that you showed, Paul, on that, um, one of the, the key things that I've always found interesting in, that, in this particular example you're showing is the design of the papillas, which Although we can mill any shape that comes in, regardless of it being in a, you know, a human, you know, trying to mimic human anatomy, what, when we mill a very razor sharp papilla, that's unrealistic. And now from a technician's point of view, doesn't that take you back to having to work manually and finesse and restack material there when you do that? You're absolutely you're absolutely right. And, you know, that's another benefit too, when we look at the cost uh, of of this this process and the the time and the and the labor savings of not having to go back in and you know manually redefine all of the gingiva and you know those kind of things you know that that saves a huge amount of time uh, you know I mean you know I sat at the bench for a very long time and I have nothing against it but you know. Uh, I'm kind of lazy, and if I can do it in the software and not have to go sit at my bench all afternoon, I'm totally going to do it that way. Um, so, yeah, come on, teeth. Fast. All right, can you guys all see this okay? Looking good. All right. So uh, while well, it's thinking here, so this is this is the teeth. So I kind of jumped through it real quick. You can see where I kind of marked it, outlined the base, and those are all the basic kind of stuff. And then here's where the teeth come in. Now, um, you know, here I, in the drop down menu, there's there's several different uh, libraries, but in the Vita library, and we've got our our Vigo teeth, in, and it's divided up. We can do triangular, rectangular, ovoid. Uh, our setups, we can do, you know, lingualized, buccalized, crossbite, Gerber, uh, and you can even mix and match. If we uncheck this here, we could do, you know, one side, lingualized, one side, you know, crossbite if we wanted to. Uh, I don't know why you would, but, um, you know, all kind of versatility. 
Uh, it is going to recommend sets that come together, but again, you can mix and match it however you want. Now, once it's in here, um, like I said, you know, these posterior teeth come in in perfect occlusion and perfect function, so we really don't want to mess with them a whole lot. Uh, so all I'm really going to do here um, is, you know, maybe take a look and mess with some of these anteriors. Um, there, let's look at our, our, our original bite. Hey, maybe I'll bring this forward a little bit. Hey, I like that better. Cool. Um, and, you know, if I want to move those posterior teeth at all, I can move them as a group, you know, and kind of rotate them out like this. Okay, that's a little more over the, the crest of the ridge. Hey, I like that better, whatever. Um, but other than that, I'm really not going to move them a whole lot. If I do any individual transformation, it's going to be on the anteriors. Like maybe, hey, let's let's uh, you know, let's tip these out a little bit, um, just see what that looks like. And then, um, you know, just to make sure that I haven't messed anything up and ensure you know proper function, uh, we can turn on the articulator here. And I'm going to get rid of it, so out of my way, and you know, go through you know some of these excursive movements here. Now, when I turn that off, hey, I like all of this here. Oh, hey, man, those are hitting a little hard, you know. So, you know, if I turn on the opposing, what do I see? Yep, those are hitting a little hard. Maybe I shouldn't have tipped them out. Maybe I'll put them back. Here I can see, oh, lingualized occlusion, exactly what I, I asked for. So, you know, you can characterize it. You can move these teeth a little bit, just as long as they're going to function uh, to individualize it, you know, so it doesn't look so much like a denture tooth, but I'm really not going to mess with these posterior teeth at all. Then when I have it, uh, oh, thank you, uh, I'm going to go forward towards, you know, manufacturing of either a, you know, a try -in or the final. And come on. Perfect, that's what I was looking for. So it's gonna ask me here about drill base uh, compensation. So real quick, um, when you guys are, are, are setting this up at the very beginning, uh, Vita Vionic base uh, type, you wanna set it up as a base with artificial teeth because what this is gonna do for you is it is gonna provide that output STL with both the monoblock and that base with the tooth pocket, okay? If you leave it at the default, which is just uh, the monoblock, it's gonna give you the monoblock and no uh, base. So always use this one, it'll give you both. And then down here in the manufacturing process, if you select milling, it is gonna give you uh, that opportunity for the uh, uh, drill compensation. Uh, whereas if you select printing, it will not. Okay, so this is what that looks like. So drill compensation, drill radius, which is something I am going to uh, throw over to uh, Greg in just a minute. Uh, so I'm gonna hit yes, this is gonna take a minute to, to calculate. So I'm gonna run through a couple more slides and then uh, hand this off over to Greg. So uh, we went to some of these uh, setups, and here's what I was talking about, that monoblock or the tooth pockets, and it'll give you both. Now you can mill it, you can print it. Uh, we still think that milling is gonna be the most accurate, so that's what we recommend, but however you wanna manufacture it is up to you. Uh, you're gonna remove the, spur, uh, the sprues, blast the cavities, um, put in the bond, Put it on the tooth, put it in, put it in the pressure pot for about 20 minutes, and you've got a rock and roll denture. So here is my info. Uh, give me a call, send me an email. We can go into more depth if you want some more information. Uh, and I am going to kick this over to Greg to talk more about the manufacturing part of this. Actually, uh, if you don't mind, um if you don't mind backing up a little bit, you brought up some really cool points. Um, if you don't mind going back to your three shape uh, design so that what uh, Greg goes into, it has a little bit more context for our, our attendees. But you mentioned two very cool and I think essential things for manufacturing in mind. Um, I think yeah. that the three of us take that for granted because we see these advancements um, and we, we adopt them quickly. But um, you showed that you can 
you can uh, show your intent, you can uh, dictate your intent to mill this, and, and then obviously Greg is gonna take tooling into consideration. Uh, one of the challenges we see with, with dentures is the undercutting or the, the undercut nature of the intaglio uh, surface. Uh, do you mind popping that open really quick so that we, we maybe for some of those that are very new to this, uh, we, we talk about that in particular? So uh, yeah, you want to you want to see like the the intaglio surface of of yeah of your base of, the, the base the base uh, drill compensation yeah so for for those of you that are that are with us today um, on the milling side of of a, a denture base what we typically look for right off the bat uh, is is the undercut can you see my screen I'm no sorry. you got to be here what's that. Go ahead. We'll make you. Uh, yeah, sure. We'll make you a presenter so that you can go ahead and share that again. Perfect. Okay. So what we look, what we're looking for typically is is how much undercutting we're going to have to deal with. Now in milling, if we get really uh, detailed about it, the machines have articulation that permit or or attempt to to get into that under pocketing, right? So the machines will articulate that disc 30 degrees in tilt and the tool will attempt to get there. Uh, one of the things that we kind of take for granted is that in the design uh, workflow that Paul is sharing with us, that's that's been taken into consideration so that when we try, when we uh, when we manufacture uh, this, this restoration, we can actually produce it and we, we're not going to have to finesse this by hand. There's another um, feature that uh, Greg, that I'd like to, uh, for Paul to touch on is we, he did a lot of uh, stippling on this case with uh, milling in mind so that the end result would be very natural. So Paul, do you mind telling us a little bit about how you did that and why you did that? Yeah, for sure. Uh, if I could find the uh, screen here again. There he is. Uh, if you guys the, the the stippling has been uh, sort of exaggerated on purpose. Uh, so this yeah, so that's exactly right. I you know one of the things it's still it's still building it, but you know once it gives us the gingiva, it gives us the option that we're used to in the tools. If you've used three shape, you know to you know sculpt, you know uh, wax on wax off, and so a lot of the stippling I would normally do in wax, I've done in this uh you know sculpting with the sculpting tool and the first couple of times i did it i noticed that you know even though it looked great on the screen uh after the machining because of the geometry of the machine and what it can and can't mill um i lost a lot of that so i actually started designing it and kind of over exaggerating it a little bit uh to kind of compensate for that so uh Greg actually milled it, and he can talk more about it, but the idea was to kind of be able to pull it right out of the mill, uh, give it a, just a quick polish, and that is it. So you're really not going to have to spend much time on the bench at all. Uh, again, we're really talking about saving time and, and labor, you know, with this process. So that, that was one of them. So uh, I don't know if you guys can see this. So I went in, and, and you know, I just used the wax knife here and, and uh, you know, just kind of, you know, and you can do this as quick or as tedious as you want, uh, want to make it, um, but it really makes a big difference on the back end. So, I think for also then, for uh, our welcome today, and then Paul, you also wanted to see about like the intaglio surface here. Is that what you were talking about in the milling to make sure that you can get all of this, you know, and the and the tool radius can capture that. Yeah, if you if you um, let's go ahead and hide the teeth. So if we look at it from frontal view, uh, you can see those. It hasn't calculated the pockets yet. Oh, it's, it's so it's calculating the pocketing right now. So, which is kind of, it, it's it's a good thing to understand is that the teeth are going to be embedded into the space, and those uh, those pockets, those sockets are going to be extruded, so the fit is going to be perfect. Now, one of the things that I thought I found fascinating, Paul, when you were telling me about this, was the exactitude that's designed into those sockets. Can you touch upon that and why that is? 
Yeah. So, you know, I talked a little bit about this before that, that, you know, like I said, to make this digital process really, uh, you know, to take advantage of it, we need to be able to translate that precision to the final you know, prosthesis. And so the, a lot of that comes down to how we're actually bonding the teeth into that denture base. And a lot of people, like I was talking about, are using uncured resin, which is very thick and viscous. Uh, we have a, a bond between the two acrylics that we developed actually several years ago uh, and, and have actually been using in Europe for the last two years. So it's, it's, we've had a really, really good success rate with it. Uh, and it works perfectly for this, this uh, application. And it's very, very thin, almost like water. Uh, and it's not meant to be gap filling. So we can actually design that with that 20 micron gap. So we're able to really take advantage of that precision in the design, um, you know, with this. And, and then, you know, again, translate that precision to the final prosthesis. Now, of course, this only works, you know, of course, it works digitally, but it only works if we can manufacture it. So, um Again, with, with kind of digital manufacturing in mind, you know, these tooth pockets and the radiuses of these uh, digital denture teeth were uh, designed so that you could mill everything with a two millimeter burr, which again, I'll let Greg talk about a little bit more, but, you know, being able to use such a large burr manufacturing, again, it's going to save lots of time you know, money and, you know, tool wear and all of that as well. So, uh, you know, we, we really Vita did a great job and really forward thinking, uh, you know, when it came to this. And this has taken forever to calculate. So if, if one of you guys wants to throw some other stuff up here, uh, go for it. We can come back to this um, in a minute. Yeah, I think, Paul, we'll, um, we'll leave that calculating. We'll kick it over to Greg and then... Uh, Greg can tell us about what it would take to manufacture this with the exactitude uh, that you just described. Uh, and also, um, he can tell us about tooling and then ultimately how long it would take. I'm particularly, I, I don't like to jump to how long thing things take first, but one of the sticking points with den digital dentures has been I don't want to put it so bluntly, but it's kind of racing against uh, the traditional process. The traditional process has been kind of perfected for a very long time, and it's quite efficient, uh, while maybe a, a dentist may not consider it so, but uh, <laughs> there's different levels of efficiency there. But if we're racing the traditional process, we have to take that into consideration. We can't just do something because it's going to be uh, prettier or more modern or more technological if at the end it takes us forever to do it. So um, you're Greg, absolutely right. We we keep coming back to you know that this has to be it has to be efficient. It has to be uh, you know cost effective and all of that you know to to really take advantage of the di digital process. So you're right. Yeah, time comes into a factor. So. Well, and, and e even if you're, you know, one to one or a little better than one to one with a digital process, the thing that's, uh, you know, often overlooked in these, these sort of conversations is the scalability of digital. You know, if I can make one, I can make a hundred. All I need to do is add equipment. Um, and so you don't have to add, uh, you know, you don't have to add that human capital in order to, to scale your business. Um, so that's, that's a, for me, it comes, you know, it comes down to the bottom line and that's, uh, that's a huge benefit to digital. Um, so I'll, I'll, uh, I've got a couple of points here on the manufacturing side. And um, so Fernando kind of led into it a little bit. Uh, you know, when we're, when we're machining a denture or uh, any, any large uh, uh, restoration or prosthesis, the, the biggest downfall is the actual machining time. Um, and so, uh, at the beginning of this, we kind of talked about the solutions that, that, uh, you know, we've all been putting together as a team and, um, what we've, uh, what we've been able to do, uh, with, uh, with Roland and Sierra and, uh, and the, uh, software developers, uh, is really substantially cut down on that machining time and, uh, create a, a result off the machine that takes a really, really minimal amount of handwork, uh, to complete. So, um, I'll just tour you through that real quick and, uh, we'll, uh, we'll jump, we'll jump into it here. So before you do anything on your, on your milling machine, um, 
you want to make sure that it's in good shape. It's, it's ready to go. Uh, milling milling uh, acrylics can be a different uh, animal than milling uh, zirconia. Um, so there's a couple of things you definitely want to check. Uh, be sure that your collet is very clean and in good shape. Um, and if you've got a high mileage collet, you, you may see some wear facets developing. Um, you know, we recommend uh, keeping an eye on that. Um, and then, uh, you know, obviously make sure your machine is up to, up to maintenance, make sure that it's uh, been fresh and ca freshly calibrated. And, uh, and then with PMMA, it tends to get pretty, um, th there's a lot of debris that's created in the mill while it's, while it's being machined. And so be careful when you're loading the puck, not to have any, uh, debris in the puck that could, that could cause it to be misaligned. Um, once you've checked all those boxes, we're, we're ready to jump into the nesting. Um, and so this is, uh, this is Millbox, if you're not familiar with that. It's uh, one of the nesting softwares that's out there. And um, the, uh, the, the solution that Sierra's put together with a special uh, roughing tool is already integrated into this. Um, so this is, uh, this is actually Paul's, Paul's design here. And a um, couple of couple of key points that I like as a as a machining guy is the design of those pockets is excellent um, if you look at the uh, if you look at the way that these things are radiused in here it's designed to be machined on the inside pocket with a uh, two millimeter tool um, so you don't have to the, the, the machine doesn't have to come in here and, and define this with a smaller tool uh, and that just comes from the design out of the CAD um, and then, uh, in addition to that, um, when you're when you're doing your initial positioning, uh, when we we're talking about undercuts earlier, I always recommend that you position the uh, the the denture either left or right. So you have the arch form pointed left or right, uh, and the reason for that is because this rotary axis uh, has more of a degree of freedom, and you can actually get better undercut um, uh, development that way. Um, and uh, second, I don't even know how many tips I'm on, but next tip on nesting is when you're sprueing, uh, you're adding your connectors, you want to connect for rigidity. Um, milling plastic, uh, plastic likes to move when it's being cut. And if you under sprue, you can end up with, um, you know, inaccuracies or surface quality uh, issues than, uh, than if you sprue correctly. So. The way that the way that we like to do it is uh, utilizing the square profiles uh, connectors, and you know one every, you know, uh, twenty percent or so of the, the the circumference here. This sort of spacing is is good. I like to keep them off of the interior aspect uh, so that we don't end up having a big fat sprue to cut off there. Um, then when we're ready, go ahead and calculate. Now this has already been pre-calculated, so I'm not going to touch it. Um, but I've got a slide here with some screenshots. So our uh, our tooling package that's integrated into the into this uh, new strategy here um, will give you the option to do the denture roughing with the D3T tool, uh, which is where you're going to get your time savings. Um, and so you have to select that, and then it'll prompt you for the tools that the the machine's going to use, um, and this is the uh, this is the plastic tool set. So, if you see the uh, the difference of the three millimeter torque tool um, compared to a uh, a ball end uh, uh, tool that's typically used, um, you'll notice that the geometry is completely different. Um, it's been designed to uh, reduce the material very very quickly. Um, this this tool is able to uh, uh, reduce material five to six times faster than the tool next to it. Uh, so just the geometric capacity is uh, is much higher. Um, so on on with that, we've gone ahead and calculated it, and I've got this thing queued up with a with a simulation, so you can kind of see how how the machining process is done. So here we are roughing it with uh, with the torque tool, and you can see how aggressive uh aggressive it is cutting the material here and we actually rough uh rough the entire uh base in about 30 minutes and uh if you are utilizing the two millimeter tool to do that 
uh, that that roughing time alone would be about two hours. Um, so this is uh, this is where the time savings comes from. So we'll go ahead and scoot this thing in here. We're almost done with roughing. Craig, uh, while we do that, I think this is a good time to address some questions. Oh yeah, we got some questions coming in. And sure. I think I think you've touched upon a lot of the concerns uh, or or sort of questions that would naturally come to mind. Uh, I think both of you guys have. So uh, I want to recap really quickly. So Paul's design uh, and the pockets of the designs had two things in mind, a natural aesthetic and also millability. And then Greg touched upon that uh, by, but when he mentioned that those pockets were intended to be milled with a two millimeter tool. So right now he's showing us the three millimeter roughing, uh, which is doing the bulk of the work. And then the two millimeter will do about 70% of the work, and then it will only call for the one millimeter tool after the fact. So that pretty much gets us to the point where Greg is at now with many, with efficient manufacturing of a you know of a very natural design. Uh, so the, to tie that into the questions, um, one of the questions, and I'll, I'll address the, the two biggies here. One is uh, what thickness of base uh, are we utilizing here? So uh, I'm assuming uh Hassan that you're you're talking about the, the puck or the stock itself so Greg address that really quickly what puck are we getting yeah, so, so this is the this is the denture based material that Vita's uh marketing um thanks Richard for sending that over here uh and it's and it's actually a 26 millimeter uh thick puck um and uh R Richard can you maybe speak to oh. the availability of different thicknesses yeah, it comes in both the, the 26 and the 30 millimeter, uh, you know, just kind of depending on, on, on what your needs are. Um, y you know, it's like uh, anybody who's done any chair side milling, you know, the blocks come in the different sizes and you're always going to want to pick the smallest block that you could fit it in because it's the less, least amount of material that you have to cut away, right? So if you can fit it in a 26, put it in a 26. If you've got some like really high uh, ridges, you know, in the posterior on something and you need a 30 millimeter, use a 30 millimeter. So, but uh, more or less, those are the two sizes I think that we're, uh, uh, that we have them available in. Yeah, and then I think this takes us to the next step, which Gary's asking, uh, the teeth come in prepackaged form. So yes, right. we'll confirm that Gary. Uh, what happens in an instance where the base is not thick enough to allow mere insertion of the teeth? Um, I think there's two implications there. One is design, the other one is stock choice, and that, that's why we pose the questions in this order. So, can you, uh, Paul, why don't you address first the, the insertion of the, so of the teeth into the sockets and then see what the implications are in stock uh, selection? So, if I understand the question right, uh, they're asking what happens if there's not enough space uh between the, the the tooth and the bottom of the denture base like it goes through is that what they're asking um and uh, you know in the past yeah we just ground on the denture tooth and we put it in the wax and stuff and we tried to redesign them so that was not necessary to do any bench modification like that and if you're in a situation where you have that little room you really need to kind of go back and look at the case itself and see exactly why and, and if there's other reasons. Um, yeah, if you're really that limited on space, there's not really a good solution for that. Um, but, you know, in my experience, that's a very, very, you know, that's kind of the exception. So, did I answer the well, question? Uh, yeah, I think the, the digital teeth are actually substantially shorter uh, than than a standard uh, you know, man manual denture tooth. So I don't think that that's as much of an issue uh, as you might as you might think it is. Yeah, I think also the, the the one thing that we I guess we're taking a few things for granted. We're moving at a pretty fast speed. These are digital teeth, as Greg uh, mentioned. These are teeth with the intent of uh, designing. Uh, you know, Paul called the teeth up into a, a matching digital library or digital representation of physical teeth. He's designing around those teeth. And then, the, as we saw in the design, there was a slight green line uh, telling us where the, the the papilla or the edge of the gingiva was. And then, so everything is digitally minded. So hopefully, um, Gary, that that kind of helps you. This is a truly uh, a true digital workflow. 
stemming from teeth that we will not have to manufacture. Um, and then we'll let Greg um, continue because I think he's going to he's going to bring it all together when he shows us um, the insertion of the teeth. Yeah. So uh, we we completed the machining, um, and I think this is the this is really the coolest part of this is that right off the machine uh, we've got a very very good surface finish and um you know i'll actually just enlarge this this image here real quick so if you can if you look and see here the fit of the of the preformed tooth into the pocket is very nice uh they they drop they basically drop right in um and uh and afterwards we can go ahead and do our our setup like uh like paul went through and uh Again, this is no polishing. This is uh, this is how the thing looks off the mill, and see if we can. I've got it here. Let's see if we can get a, a good a good image of it here. Do this, Greg. Stop sharing your screen for a second. Um, oh yeah, to those images, and then show us that physical representation, um, which I think is tremendous because that you just nailed it. Now, question to you, and I might put you into a into a, a spot here. Um, how much polishing or finishing did you have to do to that base when you took it off the machine? Oh, I've done no, there's been no polishing done. Uh, and so you can see the reflectivity of the surface here. Um, you know, if I were, if this were a, a real case, not a practice case, you know, it would take a real quick pass and it'd be ready to go. Um, I don't know if that's focusing good enough here. Yeah, if you just leave it still for just a second, right there. Yeah, there you go. You did no post finishing on that. You just took it off the machine. You milled it with the, the toric tool, the two millimeter, and did you come in with a one millimeter after the fact? Uh, yeah. So the only area where it's used the one millimeter is actually on the stip on the stippling uh, to give a little bit more detail there. But uh, this this result could be completely attainable with two tools. Um, and that, how long did that take you to to mill? Right about two and a half hours. And uh, again, because we've reduced the uh, I'll try to hold it still because we've reduced the uh, the roughing. Um, you know, we've taken taken that down uh, from around four or five hours. Uh, so it's uh, it, it it's substantial and it makes it to where this can be cost effective. Okay. Now one of the questions is uh, because you said the pocketing was done with the two millimeter tool, uh, and this is a question to both of you. Maybe Paul can address it quickly. What, was there a radius compensation set? For the pockets, Paul, what was your radius? Your uh, you showed a tool. What was your radius compensation or your diameter compensation for the pocketing tooling? Is it one millimeter or two, or point uh, or or two? That's built into the library, if I'm not mistaken, right? Right, Paul? Uh, yeah, I'd have to look off the top of my head. It's supposed to be, um, you know designed for a two millimeter burr. So, you know, a, a, a one millimeter radius, I think on there it's like 1.3 uh, that, you know, when I do my, my tooling like that, I usually do, you know, if it's a two millimeter burr, I usually give myself a little bit extra just for, you know, tool flexion and wear. So yeah, a, a radius 1.3, something like that. So, for, and we apologize for, for many of you that maybe this is a little bit too technical, uh, there's an important, the question was posed, so that's why we addressed it, because I think we have different levels of, of maybe of know-how in the group, but that is a key um, a key component of digital manufacturing with the end in mind. So Paul's answer is kind of cool, because he's saying, you know what, I really didn't have to uh, address that because it's already designed into the library. So that contouring, uh, because it's intended for, he said he was going to mill this in, at the end, already takes into consideration a two millimeter radius for the pocketing. And then when Greg did the manufacturing, he went through three millimeter, two millimeter, and then the one millimeter addressed all that, all that finessing and, and stippling and really, you know, the high um, aesthetic, uh, that natural look that Paul had designed into the, the case. So, I love this. I love this workflow because it is uh, is this, it obviously it has to meet the the fit and the the comfort of, of the case, but ultimately it's a realistic aesthetic case that gives you a premium product in an efficient amount of time. 
Is that overselling it, guys, or is that would that be true? No, not at all. And yeah. and one of the other great things that I'd like to just kind of point out for those people that are like, oh, this looks kind of cool and whatever, is that uh, you know most labs that I know because they've already done some of this crown and bridge already have three shaper exocad, and most labs I know already have a mill, and that provided you already have those things, uh, it costs nothing to, to try this out. Uh, you know, the, the Vita Tooth Library is totally free. As long as you have the denture module, uh, you can download it. Um, you know, all you have to do is buy the Vigo teeth, just like you would buy any set of denture teeth, and mill it on the mill you already have. Uh, you know, so it, like I said, it costs nothing to try it out and get started. See if it works for you. See which pieces of it you like and what work for your 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 business. You know, so. But yeah, Greg. I mean, uh, what would you add on the? I mean, I think uh, another reason why we did this talk is that we find that a lot of CMB labs, right, at some point maybe were because of efficiencies outsourcing some of their work to dentists, and maybe today, you you have to look to yourself for autonomy. Uh, because you're maybe you're the one up and running, or maybe this is something you've been wanting to implement for a long time. You've been primarily a CMB lab, and then now you want to bring in efficiencies around denture milling, and uh, that's why we wanted to talk about this. But what what do you see, Greg, um, along the, the the comment that Paul just made? You already have efficiencies and know how on the design, on the manufacturing, and you definitely have material know how. What what do you think? should be a consideration today for the laboratory you know as as a digital lab you know if you're for, I, th I think everybody at this point knows that that removables is probably the fastest growing segment of the dental lab business and if you already have if you already have digital equipment in your lab the barrier to entry to get into it is pretty low um, it's it's just a matter of getting the materials in the process in and uh and and implementing it um, and there's there's a lot of help. There's a lot of resources out there to get that going. Uh, you know, us three to 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 name a few. Um, and so uh, I I would encourage anybody who's not uh, looking at at milling dentures or milling removables to uh, to take a hard look at it and uh, see if it's a good fit for their business case. Yeah, yeah, and and I also thank you both for that. I, I'm trying to pose the questions that I believe our 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 attendees would um, would be interested in from a sort of a, a novice uh, point of view. You guys both having years of experience, like many of the people that join us today. Um, so maybe my my questions are a bit simplistic, but uh, let me, let's go back to the actual. Let's go back to questions that our panel's asking, and and they're challenging, you know, because they're you know we kind of know what to expect from one another. But let's let's take a look. Um, so Gary, uh, I think is continuing along the the, the lines of. I, I believe Gary, you're looking at teeth off the. Sh you're looking at carved teeth that have not been digitized. That's my sort of my assessment of your question. So I'll pose the question to the guys. So further to the question prior, uh, immediate denture design does not always allow sufficient room for full teeth. In there, I would put a parentheses, full teeth that I don't have a digital library library for, right? And then, um, how do I take packaged teeth after my design is done and insert them into pre-milled base with sufficient space? Am I to assume, Paul, that those are teeth that ha I don't have a matching digital library for? Uh, if he's talking like parcels and stuff, like uh, you know, part of part of what we're we're uh, I don't want to say fighting because that's the wrong word. Part of the thing that we're we're still working on as we're growing this digital technology is all you know aspects and applications that uh, right now the software is written for a full denture over full denture and that is kind of the approved workflow that is out there and I know that everybody's super excited about digital dentures and so you know full dentures over full denture is kind of boring they're like well what about this what about this and what about that you know and and I, and I love that attitude because that's me too um, but uh, we haven't quite got there yet on some of the stuff so uh, we're still working on you know solutions for like a, a full denture over uh, natural dentition because with with um, uh, you know, pre-manufactured teeth, there's no way to mill or adjust that, occlusal, you know, the, the anatomy on the occlusal surface. So you'd have to end up doing that by hand. 
How's the, how can we solve that digitally? I don't know yet. We're still working on that. RPD is the same thing. Uh, RPD frameworks, if you guys are doing uh, digital design on RPD frameworks, I've been doing that since 2014 and it is awesome. I totally recommend it. Uh, but how do you integrate you know, this, these kind of digital keys into that yet? And that's not quite there because I don't know, you know, we, we, we're still working on a solution to, to get that denture base onto that metal framework. Um, you know, I've been working with some other labs and some guys and we've got some ideas. Same thing with like a, a printed digital denture over a, an implant framework. You know, so all of these things, we're working on it. You know, we're working on different solutions, but we don't have all of the answers yet. Uh, you're just going to have to be a little patient with us. Um, you know, this is new, not just to you guys, but to, to everybody. And so, um, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can as fast as we can. And we appreciate your input, your, your enthusiasm and, you know, everything that you guys do for us. So anyway, I know that was kind of a long winded no, answer, but I, hopefully I that answers your question. I think, look, I, I think these are every case, uh, what I find fascinating about the denture world or, or the, 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 the dental restoration world, uh, I've been sort of an expectator and sort of, an, uh, uh, you know, a business developer for about 10 years in this segment, but I don't come from this world. So I still find so many things fascinating is that there are so many challenges. We find with every solution, we, we, we have that sort of uh, that, that impetus to look at the next thing, right? So one of the things that we were talking about is that not only does this work for um, re removables, but it also, you could, you could take the same uh, efficiency and capability for uh, a, a, a structure over, uh, an implant bar, right? So it doesn't really stop here because uh, you can take a milled base and you can uh, screw it to a substructure, correct? Uh, which is, so it, it, it's almost like industrial design in, in constant evolution, right? Yeah, and we're, and we're working on all of those things. We just don't have, you know, per, you know, solutions quite yet. But yeah, all of those things are absolutely right. And, I, you know, I'm testing all of those things. So yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. All right. I'm always very sensitive to the questions in the panel. Um, so I, I don't like going to presentations where uh, I ask questions and they don't get addressed. So we have four minutes or so to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, if you guys are okay with us stretching a couple more minutes to address your questions, go ahead and put it in the panel. Uh, but there are two questions, and they're very they're they're poignant questions. One of them is, uh, how long did it take to design? Can you give us a quick answer, Paul? On how long does it take you to design a denture? Uh, you know, it it really it kind of depends. Uh, you know, on how. You know, the three shape software. I love the software. It has a, amazing tools. But it can be as complicated or as simple as you want it to be. Uh, you know, this particular denture, because I, I'm, it's one that I use as a demo. I spent a little bit extra time on it. Um, you know, identifying all the landmarks, going through everything. I would probably say maybe 15 minutes to design a denture. Again, I don't want to move the teeth too much because I want to leave that occlusion. Uh, I, Mostly what I'm going to do is a little characterization of the anteriors, um, you know, some stippling and, and designing the gingiva and move on. Like, again, you know, I, I want to make the best looking product I can, but I also need it to be efficient. So uh, 15, 20 minutes. This one probably I spent maybe 25 minutes on. Uh, but it really, you know, if it takes much longer than that, it, 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 it's just not efficient. Um, excellent. Cool. Uh, and sorry, I keep muting myself so I don't give you too much uh, uh, feedback. Uh, we're already getting uh, positive feedback from the group. Thank you very much. I hope this was informative for you guys. Uh, this is something that obviously we didn't mention uh, the situation we're in. It's kind of a given. We're all in the same boat right now, but we, we, we we're looking to things that in this downtime where everyone is seeking information, we're trying to give you tangible tools that you can implement into your laboratory. Uh, I think all of us are going back to work with, with efficiency in mind. Uh, I think one of the things that drives us nuts is the inefficiencies in our work. And this is a time that allows us to probably look at things and, and maybe uh, from a philosophical point of view, not go back to the same madness we lived in before, right? So we want to, we felt that this was a topic that gave you guys 
uh, efficiencies that you can implement with the tools that you have. Um, there are some questions, uh, while I'm very sensitive to, uh, to addressing all the questions, some of the questions are very granular and they, they require probably one-on-one -on -one assistance. So I am going to uh, ask some of you, uh, because your questions are um, very specific to your workflow, to uh, direct them directly to us. Uh, so you can contact Greg, myself, or Paul directly, or Roland. Uh, and uh, Paul, why don't you go ahead and, and pop up uh, your contact information? Um, yeah, yeah. We will we will start wrapping the session up. Um, in, in the meantime, we'll, ask, we'll answer one more question. Uh, Hoyle asked, I think of, um, I think there was a question around the cost to manufacture. Um, so what we'll do with that, not that I'm trying to avoid the question, not to get too commercial, I would ask that you guys contact um, Vita North America and inquire uh, about buying the discs and the teeth, unless Paul, you're comfortable or you, you have the information to answer. And if you don't, it's okay. So um, yeah, I, I don't, you know, I'm the technical guy. So most of the time I don't see the dollar signs. Uh, you know, if you email me, we can certainly get all that for you. That's not a problem. I just don't have them in front of me. Um, well, well, I'll send it back to the, to the, to the panel. Uh, our goal today was to show you uh, tips and tricks to implement efficiencies from design to milling. Um, please give us some feedback as to whether you guys well, were able to get what you were looking for today in the questions panel. If you have quickly any questions we can address, we're perfectly happy to address them. Uh, but we wanted to give you guys information that we thought was relevant and that you can implement into your workflows today. Um, and we really appreciate your attendance and uh, wish you all well. Uh, now and always. So I think with that said, uh, we're going to start wrapping it up. Uh, thank you. We're getting some feedback that uh, it was informative. Um, and we will do more. So we do have uh, we do have topics coming up associated with removables, digital manufacturing. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you for your comments and your uh, validation that uh, this was uh, this was uh, useful to you guys. So with that, I'll allow you guys to sign off. I thank you, Paul and Greg, for, for putting this together and uh, joining me today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having us. You know, I, I love this technical stuff and, and, you know, gadgets and stuff. And so this is this is playtime for me. So thank you for having me. It's, it's, it's nerd talk, I guess. Thanks, Fernando. Appreciate it. It's been a pleasure.